the purpose and power of impartation. Purpose and power of impartation. Starting in the book of Acts chapter 2, it talks about the day of Pentecost. Somebody say the day of Pentecost. Talking about purpose and power, what Jesus had promised the church and what was about to happen. Jesus had told his disciples that they are to remain in Jerusalem until they are endued with power from on high after the Holy Ghost has come upon them. And, and then they shall be witnesses to him of Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, uttermost parts of the earth because of this explosive impartation. And the thing was they were excited about the infilling grace of God. They were excited about what was about to happen because in themselves they didn't have the ability to advance any of the cause of Calvary, or the purpose of Calvary, or the power of the name of Jesus. So they knew that they needed this impartation. They'd watch Jesus walk in this and flow in this and operate in this. And he had said the same comforter, the same anointing, and the same spirit that was on him and in him would flood and fill the body of Christ. And they were to hunger and thirst after this most explosive indwelling of God's presence, it's the impartation of God. And how the impartation came is in chapter 2. The Bible says it in verse 1, it says, When the day of Pentecost had fully come, the understanding of God's harvesting and gathering, of His increasing and His equipping, they were all with one accord in one place. And I always got to remind us as the body of Christ, as believers, we need to be in one accord with the Word of God. We need to be in one accord with what God's Word says. That can never be a compromise to the believers. The strength of the church is when they are in one accord with what the Word of God says. And when the Word of God says something, they have a hunger to see that Word become life inside of them. The impartation of that Word. How can I have that Word produce the faith power effect in me? And that is when we are one accord in the Word of God. Then we come always expecting that what God's Word says... God's Word is going to provide, and God will operate by faith in our lives what He said He will do. So when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all in one accord with the same expectation. Somebody say expectation. God had promised something. Jesus had promised something. It didn't come the moment He promised it, but He said it is coming. Somebody say it's coming. And when he said it's coming, you can bank out whatever God says will come to pass. It will be revealed. It will explode. If you stand your ground in the very fact that God said it shall be so. That's the powerful point of this. What God said shall be so. That's why it's important that we understand the one accordness in the word. What does the word say? How does the word operate? And it says, and suddenly, verse 2, somebody say Suddenly. See, a God's moment is a suddenly. Somebody say suddenly again. God's moment is not a gradual. It's a suddenly. It's a storm of glory that suddenly appears. When God is ready to move, it is a suddenly. When it's time to part of Jordan, it's a suddenly. When it's time to bring a miracle, it's a suddenly. When it's time to bring change in direction, it's a suddenly. God is a awesome, suddenly demonstrating God. And we as believers should always be expecting the suddenlies of heaven, the great transformation movement, how God suddenly touches your life, how he suddenly gives you a revelation of his word. Suddenly there's that impartation and you suddenly realize by faith something God has said and then you act on it immediately because it came as a suddenly. And it says, it says, in the, and suddenly it came from heaven, a sound of heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. It filled the whole house where they were sitting and there appeared to them divided, somebody say divided, divided tongues of fire and one sat upon each one of them. Somebody say impartation. impartation. To each individual in that room came a unique impartation, a calling and an anointing into their life. The Holy Spirit showed up in the house as a suddenly. And God began to, to move so that each life had its own tongue of fire. Each life had a blaze of God's glory. Each life had a uniqueness of the presence of God. Each life in their uniqueness had the touch of heaven <clears throat> because you are unique before God. And in all that God is, He has a uniqueness in the calling that's for your life and the impartation that is for you. But in that same thing, it comes from one and the self, same Holy Spirit, connected to the one and self, same Lord, operating in the one and self, same glory of the Father. 
to accomplish the ultimate work that Jesus had, to build his church and you are his church. So the uniqueness of an impartation is so that you can run your race as God designed you to be. Therefore, you are unique in God. The impartation is unique from God, but the impartation is power from heaven. Are you hungry for an impartation from God? What do I need from heaven? What is the flash of God's glory for my life? Every believer ought to hunger. Jesus said, you need to hunger and thirst. Whoever thirsts, come to me. Because out of your innermost being should flow rivers of living water. That's what Jesus promised the believers. That's what he promised the disciples. That's what he promised those that were hungry and thirsty. There is something coming. Dead Christianity has nothing to do with the kingdom of God because the kingdom of God is life and power, holiness, and the anointing and impartation of God's abundant grace. And the Bible says the, the result of the impartation, the reaction to the impartation, and they were all filled. Somebody say filled. Somebody say filled. They weren't sprinkled with the Holy Spirit. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. It was craziness in the upper room. Somebody say hallelujah. It was craziness in the upper room. It was a praise meeting like they never had before. It was a shouting meeting like they never had before. It was a victory meeting like they never had before. It was church, how church ought to be. A shout and a glory, an explosion of God's presence. Believers coming together with the outpouring impartation of God, moving into their life, liberating, setting them free, so that what goes in begins to come through and begins to birth forth in the words that God has declined or declared for your life. And notice, and they all began to speak with other tongues, and the word says they began to speak with other tongues, and ultimately to prophesy as the Spirit of God came on every one of them, because that's what everybody heard them doing. Praying, worshiping, prophesying, speaking God's kingdom. There is an outflow to the inflow of the word of God. Now somebody say prophecy. The prophetic word of God that's coming forth is the edification, exhortation, the direction and the comforting of God. Suddenly birthed forth from each one of these people is what the word of God is intended to do. Come alive and begin to speak what God wants to do and operate in your life. To declare the mercies of God, the goodness of God, the holiness of God, the faith of God. The impartation transforms, are you ready? Your language. The impartation of God transforms your language. Now out of you, instead of the world flowing and hell flowing and doubt flowing or fear flowing, or anything else flowing, comes suddenly the kingdom of God is flowing. The heart of heaven is flowing. The word of the Lord is flowing. God's edification, exhortation is flowing from you. God's directions are flowing. There's a whole new flow because your words are changed. There's a transformation of the words of your mouth because of the impartation, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Now I want you to go back into the book of Exodus, all the way back. I want you to go back to chapter 3 in the book of Exodus. Because there are several things that this thing does, this impartation. And we're going to go back to Moses. Somebody say Moses. Moses would have an external revelation of what to you and I becomes the internal revelation. Here you go. Moses will have an external revelation to what you and I are supposed to have on the internal revelation. And this is an impartation which is going to bring vision. Somebody say vision. The impartation is going to bring vision with it. The infilling power of God transforms your speech, transforms your language. It's not just praying in tongues, which is a power of the infilling power of God, but it's also beginning to speak the kingdom of God, begin to speak the word of God, the transforming power of God. It changes your language. The church ought to speak spirit-filled all the time. That's a high call. We ought to be speaking as spirit-filled believers and the kingdom of God and the word of God. That's our offensive weaponry. The word of God is being spoken by the spirit of God. Now, back in, back in Exodus chapter 3, we find Moses having been offended, having been defeated. Moses, who was born as, a, as an awesome child to be useful to the kingdom of God, had made an error and a mistake and had to run from God's kingdom and run from, or run from his purpose and run from his plan and run from his calling and hid himself off in a wilderness. And it was 40 years. 40 years wandering is what Moses would do 
unto a transformation of his own life. That's how long Moses was on the backside of a mountain. He was almost 40 years of age when he ran, and he was 80 years of age when he would start his ministry. And he would live to be 120. So that's good that he lived to be 120. Because at 80, most of us are done with our ministry. But here is a man had the call of God, and he had run to the backside of the wilderness, had been living as a sheep herder. Meanwhile, the outcry of an entire nation was constantly coming before God. I warned the church. The nation has not changed, crying out for deliverance and revival. Millions of lives are being lost to the powers of darkness, and so much of the body of Christ is living on the backside of a mountain, offended with God because of some failure or some breakdown, something didn't go through. But what I'm so glad, somebody say so glad, is that God is not done with the body of Christ yet. There is a revelation of another impartation coming down to the believer, and that's what's about to take place in Moses' life. God hears the cry of the broken. He hears the cry of the hurting. He hears the cry of the vileness of what's taking place. And through Jesus Christ, he has given an answer. And that is by the impartation and filling power of the Holy Spirit on all those that have embraced the, the cross of Calvary and redemption that's in his blood. Jesus has an answer and the answer is coming in a wave of glory. It's an impartation of God's power. But it comes with vision. If you look at chapter 3, it says Moses was taking the the sheep on the backside of a mountain, and the mountain happened to be the very mountain in which God's glory would eventually arrive, and God's splendor would eventually, would eventually reveal itself to a nation as tens and tens of thousands of angels, the glory cloud of great splendor, which was for a nation. But for Moses, it's a personal revelation and an impartation. And it says, Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, which was his father-in-law, and he was the, who was the priest of Midian, and he and he had the, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert, and came to Horeb, the mountain of God, which is also known as Sinai. Same location. Who would have known? A place of impartation was about to become a place of of establishment and perfection and training and equipping, but it had to become a place of impartation first. And it says, and the angel of the Lord appeared to him in the flame of fire from the midst of a bush. Now Moses gets an exterior revelation of the fire of God. And fire is always representative of holiness and zeal and purity and strength. Fire has everything to do with holiness and zeal, purity and strength. It's not, the rain is nice to saturate you, but the fire of God is what puts zeal in you. The fire of God is what purges you. The fire of God is what puts the strength of heaven in you. Because God is to his glory is a blazing internal fire of heaven moving constantly to reveal the holiness of God. And he gets this all in a bush. It's amazing what you get in the infilling power of the Holy Spirit. It's amazing that the impartation of God goes on inside your life. When that flame of fire sits down on your life, that, that's God's power, that's God's holiness. My gosh, that's God's might, that's God's revelation. Everything is taking place on the inside of the born-again believer. When you get filled with the Holy Ghost, God begins to fill you with himself and his zeal and his heart and his language and everything. And in that, he's going to begin to speak to you about purpose. Somebody say purpose. The angel of God appeared in a flame of fire, and he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. It's amazing. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. And just as a quick side note on this, you can see revival taking place all you want, but unless you want, unless you want in, it will never talk to you. Revival can happen all around you, but unless you open your spiritual eyes and say, I want in, it will never speak to you. Revival is always shouting for redemption, always shouting for impartation. The power of God always wants to fill you. But unless you're willing to go there and allow yourself to be there, all you're going to do is see something that you cannot experience until you surrender yourself to it. Moses had to make a decision. I see the bush, I'm going to go to the bush. Now most people would probably go to the bush. But a lot of people when it comes to the fires of revival and an awakening of God, they see the fire here and they go that way. I'm good enough, I'm fine. The last thing I need is a word from God because I'm too busy with the words going out of my own life and what's going out of my own head. I don't have time for a move of God. And church, we're failing a lot because we're not looking for a revival and an awakening of heaven. And here it is. And Moses said, I will now see this sight, 
this great sight, why the bush doesn't burn. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him and he said, Moses, Moses. It was, you know what's awesome about impartation? He said, God knows your name. His impartation is talking to you. He doesn't fall on you and say, and what's your name again? Which one are you? Pull up a Rolodex to figure out who you are. See, that's, the, that's the awesomeness about being a child of God because you realize you are a child of God. Also being a born again believer. The world wants to think you have no purpose. God says you've got all kinds of purpose. He created you for purpose. Designed you for purpose. Shaped you for purpose. And it only comes into existence when his glory can get in. Because then his glory can call you by name. God knows who you are. And he calls you that way into the purpose. And the impartation the spirit of God speaks to you. Calls you deeper into the purpose of God. And this is exactly what Moses begins to do. And he responds and he says, you need to take your shoes off in a sense. Because this place is holy ground when God begins to move. And God begins to impart. It's not for natural things. It's for the supernatural things. And the man has to become co completely naked before God in a sense. The shoes coming off represent almost a nakedness in the presence of God. It represents a complete surrender and a submission to where he's at. You consecrate the platform of God's impartation as being holy. Somebody say holy. holy. The platform of God's impartation is a holy platform. And we have to address it as a holy platform. And God begins to speak to them. And what did I say? With the impartation comes the vision. All right? And he says, do not draw near the place, where you, the place where you're standing is holy. Moreover, he says, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Somebody say the power of the word. I am the God of promise and covenant. I'm the God of the word. I'm the God of the promise to Abraham, the provision to Isaac and the restoration and the completed work to Jacob. I am the God of all things, of all these things I've begun. I am that God. I've come to bring my impartation through and bring my calling to the next level. Somebody say next level. God always reminds you of his word. Somebody say word. The impartation is never outside the word of God. It always connects with God's promises, with God's foundations, and how you're going to be a part of what God has said. Or the, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost was to be a fulfiller and a mover of all the things that God had said. I will pour out my spirit on your sons and your daughters. I'm going to bring the impartation to revelation of heaven. I'm going to bring the kingdom of God. I'm going to build my church. All the things that he said that they had, when that impartation came, it was with a purpose. They weren't just filled to sit in the, other, in the upper room. They were filled to bring that word and that impartation out from where they were at. And here Moses is standing before God and God says, number one, I'm the God of your forefathers. I'm the God of covenant. I'm the God of promise. And he says, verse seven, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. Okay, there was revelation in the impartation of the situations around you. Under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, you can suddenly get compassion for people. You can suddenly get a revelation of righteousness and see where unrighteousness is. Become like a Nehemiah. You have to embrace this thing and begin to go to war on how you're going to see the breakthrough. Under the impartation of God, the way things were no longer become status quo. God wants to change and you get that holiness on the inside and you begin to see things for what they are. That impartation speaks to you about the heart of God and shows you that heart in accord with the circumstances around you. And God begins to speak to those things because that anointing is for a purpose. Somebody say purpose. purpose. You're going to confront something. That's why the church runs from the Holy Spirit sometimes. That's why they run from the Holy Spirit. That's why they want to shut the Holy Spirit off. Because they're so afraid when they walk into that gas station, the impartation of God's going to tell them to talk to somebody. And the last thing they want to do right now is they want to talk to somebody. They want to get their coffee, they want to pay for their gas, wave to somebody and walk out the door. They do not want to engage anything. And the Spirit of God is right there wanting to nudge them, so I ain't got time for the Holy Spirit because I'm afraid He might have me do something. I didn't get saved to do something. That I just talked to a bunch of people. I didn't get saved to do something. I just got saved to get saved. That's my own personal relation with God. That my religion is private to me. No, it's not. It wasn't private to Jesus on that cross. 
He hung bare naked, beat me on recognition as an open demonstration and declaration of God's love and His covenant for you. He didn't do it privately. He did it before the whole world. And He asked us to walk in the same thing. That impartation is that you can walk in the same anointing. It is a public declaration. We cannot hide from the covenant of God. That's why a nation is going to hell and a generation is being swept in by all the demonic forces because the impartation wants to come. People want to hide it from God. They want to hide from God. They don't want the Holy Ghost because it might change their life. Well, your life could use some changing. Your life could use to be shook up a bit. And Moses' life was about to be shook up a bit. All of his offenses, all of his problems are having to be addressed. As God said, I have heard their cry, so I have now come down, verse 8, to deliver them. Somebody say, deliver them. That's called the work of the ministry. Somebody say, work of the ministry. The ultimate work of the ministry is to set somebody free. The first work of the impartation of the Holy Spirit is to set you free. The first work of the impartation of the Holy Spirit is to set you free. And once you are set free, then you can begin to see others set free. First work of the impartation of the Holy Spirit is to liberate you. And then once you are liberated, other people can be liberated. I've come down to deliver them out, to bring them out of the hands of the Egyptians, what seems to be impossible. I have not changed my mind. I don't care how far in the backside of the mountain you run. I found you right here. And my anointing is going to come that I can bring them into the land good and large, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place where all the enemies may dwell. I know they're there, but I've come to drive them out. It's time. Somebody say, it's time. The impartation brings the revelation of the heart and the wisdom of God. But with the vision comes a response. And somebody say, obedience. The biggest problem with Moses is Moses had to choose to obey God. When God wants to show you something, he's asking for an obedience. And it was beyond what Moses wanted to do. Moses tried and he died as far as he was concerned. And now this impartation, this revelation of God says, I want you to go right back down there and I want you to set my people free because I'm going to go with you. It's time for me to fulfill the vision. And Moses knew the vision. He had it in the first place. And he got offended with failure. Ran to the backside of a mountain. And God found him there. And that's so exciting. God knows just where to find you. He will hunt you down like the God that he is. Because of his love for you. I love it that God chases us. When you read the Psalms, you find out all the mercy God does on the nation of Israel. It's because of his friendship with Abraham. Because of his love and relationship with Isaac. Because of their sake, I'm going after your kids and your grandkids and your great-grandkids because I promised these something, so I'm hunting them down. Keep hunting us down, Jesus. Keep hunting your people down, Lord. Don't give up on me, Lord. How many of you ever time you've ever said that before the Lord? Lord, don't forget me. Don't give up on me, Jesus. Please don't give up on me. One more time, Jesus. And when I mess up, one more time, Jesus. When I mess up, one more time, Jesus. That's all right. Because God wants to hunt you down because he wants to use you. Hell is what's been standing in the way. And he's come to wreak havoc on the devil's kingdom. And Egypt had been ruling as the devil's kingdom over the people of God. And they were being oppressed and depressed. Slaughter of the innocent children were taking place. And God said, it's time for me to move that nation to the place where I've called them. The impartation is a revelation of the purposes of God, but it requires obedience. God wants to move people from here to there. And Moses had to argue with him and debate with him. And you all know the story. I can't talk. I can't this. I can't that. Finally, God basically said, shut up. I'll bring somebody to walk alongside you, but you're going to Egypt to bring them out. Somebody say to bring them out. Now, I want you to turn your Bibles to Matthew. Matthew chapter 8. Okay? Because the impartation of God is going to bring power. Somebody say power. Power. Somebody say power. Oh, we love power. The impartation brings power going to bring a change of your speech. It's going to bring the vision, the revelation of God. But it's going to expect obedience in order to fulfill it because you're going to have to trust what God just said to your life. We don't want the gifts of the Spirit to operate. We don't want to hear God. The nation of Israel in, in the wilderness said, Moses, you hear from God. We're fine. No, God wants you all to hear from Him according to the Word. Now notice in chapter 8. I want you to look at verse 14 on down here for a minute. 
Because when you get the impartation and you get the vision and you get the wisdom of God and you begin to choose to walk in obedience, there are some storms you just might face going through the will of God. So there's two things that you've got to have, and one is the power of God. But the power of God's going to have to come only on one other dimension. But first, let's get the power in. It says in verse 14, this is Jesus operating the kingdom. Somebody say kingdom. He's operating the kingdom. And when Jesus had come into Peter's house, this is after he had healed the leper. He had released the word of faith to a centurion over his servant because, he, because the centurion understood Jesus' power. Everybody's getting excited about this demonstration of an impartation because the demonstration of the impartation becomes the power of God. And it says, when Jesus had come into Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother lying sick with a fever. This is what you see. But how do you operate with what you see? Do you let what you see control you? Or do you allow the speech that's in you and the word of God that's in you to speak against what you see or begin to transform what you see? Did I make sense in that? What you see can control you or what's on the inside can control you. What you see can control your speech or what you know in the impartation can direct your speech and confront your circumstance, your circumstance, your circumstance, I can say all this at once, so that it changes to fit your speech. Is that radical? That's radical. Jesus said, you got to speak to the mountain, don't you? You can't say, oh, look at the size of that mountain. Oh my gosh, that mountain is huge. That mountain will never move. Well, then it will never move. Your circumstance will never change. But the impartation of God on the inside says, speak to that stupid thing. Tell it to get out of your way. Sounds crazy, but it's supernatural. God says, speak to it. Well, he sees his, sees his mother-in-law sick with a fever, so he touches her hand, and the impartation of power moves from Jesus to the woman. The sickness and disease is driven out. Supernatural strength moves right into her body to make up for all the loss, and she stands up, gets up, and begins to work and operate in the kitchen to feed them and minister to them. Impartation brought power. Look at verse 16. And when evening had come, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed. Somebody go, wow. I know. They were demon-possessed. The community was just full of devils. Demon-possessed, and he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all that were sick so that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet. For those that don't believe God heals, them, or you got the writer Matthew speaking about how Jesus operated, the ministry of Jesus, the power ministry of Jesus, is because he took our infirmities and our sicknesses. He challenged both the sins and the diseases and the circumstances and the failures. He took them all away. He took them to himself and released power in their place, kingdom, for demonstration of power. Now, this is good because we have, because we got power, and because we got the power, we've got the next level. Now we got a demonstration of the impartation in power, and notice what happens in verse 18. Connected to the impartation, we've got the vision. Vision requires what? Obedience. Because the impartation changes the way we speak. The impartation brings power, which is demonstration. Demonstration draws people. It gets exciting. Notice, it says that when Jesus saw these great multitudes about him, he gave a command to depart to the other side because the impartation knows how to lead you. But if you're walking right into the impartation, it doesn't matter where you're going because you know God is with you wherever you go. Somebody say amen to that. Because there's a clause in this. And it says here, and when he brought to the other side, and a certain scribe came and said, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. People say a lot of things, don't they? I'll go wherever you go. They love it when things are happening big. First move of God, oh, I want that. But there's a dimension here. And he said, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Another disciple said, Lord, first let me take care of all my affairs at home. I want to follow you, Lord, but, but I got to take care of my aging parents. I got my siblings there. I got the business to take over. I'd love to follow you. But Jesus, I got other things that are right now more pressing than following you. What's more, what's more press, what can be more pressing on your life than following Christ? What can be more pressing than living for Jesus? It's, it's, it's your eternity. It's the dimension of everything that's in, your, that's in you. And, and he says, 
And he says, you know, just let, follow me and let the dead bury the dead. In order to walk in the impartation, not only is there obedience, but there must be the price that has to be paid. The price of total surrender. The price of complete commitment. The price of surrendering everything to Christ. The price of being willing to go where he says. The price of being willing to speak his word. The price, the demonstration of the power of God in the impartation requires a price. And the price is all of us. Every part of our being. Every part of our thinking and our action. To walk in the continuous demonstration of God, the church must be willing to pay the price. And the price is that there is no place where you're going to rest. You're going all the way with God. Too often we want to go far with Jesus. We want to go so far with Christ. I'll follow Jesus this far. I only want to go this much. You'll never know the demonstration of God unless you're willing to pay the whole price. What does it take? Jesus gave it all, ladies and gentlemen. And the church wants to set clauses and standards of, that, of where they will and will not go. You don't know the end result, but the goal is you're going all the way. Somebody say all the way. There is a price because unless you are willing to pay the price, are you with me? You will never be able to face the storm. Unless you are willing to pay the price, you will never be able to face the storm. The impartation brings a revelation and brings a heart and a call of God. With that comes a what? An obedience because they got to have a speech change. But with that comes the power and the presence of God. But with that power and presence means I got to move forward. That means I got to pay a price. I'm all in with the Holy Spirit. Because unless I'm willing to pay the price, I will not have the covenant heart and mind of God and every storm that stands in my way will be a reason for me to quit. When you're willing to pay the price, then the storms become nothing more than foundations in which your faith will be strengthened. If you're willing to pay the price, the storm will become nothing more than a foundation to strengthen your faith walk. But without the price paid, the storm will become the hindrance and the stopgap, and you will never move farther with the anointing of God. You have to be willing. I'm all the way. Somebody say all the way. All the way. That means that every storm that comes is going to have to go. Every storm that rises up is going to have to be confronted. Every storm that stands against you will be thrown aside. And Jesus is about to prove it in the very next couple of verses because he was committed. He was paid the price. He was going to the other side and no storm was going to what? Stop him. Because what's the ultimate call? There's people that need to be set free. Almost done. Turn to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy. You all still with me? 1 Timothy. Chapter 1, verse 18. Receiving the impartation is the ability to call the election to be equipped. Some say equipped. The impartation of God's presence equips you. The equipping is for a purpose. You've got the wisdom of God, the vision of God. You make the obedience to God. You get the power of God. You've got to pay the price in that. Now you need the equipping of God because the equipping of God allows you to do the next one. That is to remain steadfast. Price is all your future. Steadfast is right here, right now. Price is all about your future. Steadfast is right here, right now. But the impartation brings an equipping. Notice verse 18, chapter 1, 1 Timothy. This charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecy, previous prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare. I guarantee you that when they laid hands on this young man, when they began to speak over him, there was a radical impartation of power that came into Timothy's life. With that impartation came the prophetic exhortation of the directions and the purposes Timothy was supposed to do. With that would come the anointing of power. So Timothy had to make a decision. He would have to pay the price, walk in obedience, so he could have the provision, so he could operate steadfast. And now here, Paul is calling it on him. That impartation brought vision and purpose. You had to make a decision to pay a price. 
for the power of God to be on your life. Now I'm asking you, as you are supplied, because the impartation brings the uniqueness to you, you are to use these, and with them you are to wage your warfare. Somebody say steadfast. My warfare is right here, right now. My steadfastness has to be right here, right now. I cannot stand steadfast unless I've paid the price. And I cannot operate in this unless I have the power because I paid the price. And I can have none of this unless I got the revelation of God on me because of the impartation and because at the same time I've chosen obedience to pay the price. Everything comes together. And he told Timothy, this is what you need to do. Fight the good fight. Wage the good warfare. One that is victorious and triumphant. Last one. Second Timothy. You should all know this now. Chapter 1. So we bring it down to us as the church. We can't win a nation for God unless we're willing to get the revelation of the heart of God and concerning the nation. We cannot win a generation to God unless we get the heart of God concerning the generation. You'll not pray through for your family or against sickness and diseases unless you get the revelation of God that he heals these things. And in all of these things, there is opposition. So unless you're willing to walk obedient and pay the price and get the supply of God and remain steadfast, you will never win. There's a price to pay in all of it. So the challenge is this. If God's promised that I will bring you in, God's promise, I will bring you through because that's his prophetic word. Everything I've said, I'm now stirring it into you. This is the moment where the impartation begins to take its place. This is the moment when I begin to move boldly in your life. This is the season when I begin to make transformations and changes. This is the prophetic heart of God. This is the moment when I challenge you to be obedient, when I challenge you to pay the price. And if you will remain steadfast and fully committed to my name and my authority, I will bring you through. I'll break the disease off your life. I'll shatter demonic powers off of your home and your family. I will see the advancement of God operating in your kingdom or operating the kingdom of God into your life, the advancement of God into your world. I will do these things. So you got to do something. Verse 6. Therefore, I remind you, to all of you who have been like Moses, who had that stirring, who had that anointing, stir up the gift of God which is in you. Stir up that heart that God placed in you. Fan into flame the kingdom of God that's in you, the gift which is in you. Stir it up. That which came on you by the impartation. He tells Timothy, in the most discouraging time, this is the moment to shine. Fan into flame. Stir that thing up. Then anointing the activity of God. Let the word begin to stir in you. The ministry begin to move on you. Let the kingdom of God begin to move through you. Timothy, this is your moment. Fan it and stir it. Stand your feet in the house. Church, this is our time to do the same thing. Every believer, every one of us, it just takes a moment. We just say, God, today I surrender. I want to engage the fight according to the heart that God had. I'll engage the heart the way God said it. I want to strive to again operate in the provision, impartation of God. I want to run my race. I want to remain steadfast in the battle. Walk in obedience. I want to pay the price. I want to spend time, Lord, with you and with your word. I want to be equipped in everything that I am. Make a decision. I'm going to run this thing and stand my ground until I see how the enemy is defeated. How I can press through. I want to go all the way. How far do you want to go in God? There's a price you've got to pay. The Bible says Jesus labored with tears and groanings and travailing. We know he labored in the garden. But how many other times did our master on a hillside throughout the night labor in the presence of his father, fully submitted to the Holy Spirit, had nothing in himself because he laid it all down. He had to fully trust the Father and the Spirit of God and, and labored all night till he came down and had the direction. After all night, he called out his disciples. And after a night of travail and weeping before heaven, 
He is prepared for a cross. There's a price to pay. But in everything, he was victorious because he walked in obedience with his father. And the power of God remained steadfast in him as he ran his race. Father, in the name of Jesus, be life over your people. Strength and dominion into their life. The wholeness and the soundness of God into them. That in them there will be no lack. No lack. You will stir them and say, I've got victory coming. The victory is coming. The victory is coming. The victory is coming. Hallelujah. Stand with me. Just stand in me. The victory is coming. The word is coming up inside of you. The word that when you speak, it will drive hell back. The word that when you speak, it will drive darkness back. The word that when you speak will bring liberation to your own soul, to your own spirit. The word that you speak will drive darkness away. The word that you speak, diseases will go. The word that you speak, there's a word that will change your language. Impartation is going to change your language. Will speak life and not death. Go to war with it. Your praise will have power. I'm telling you, body of Christ, our days are now to walk in everything that God has. Don't miss it, church. Stir up the fire of God. Hunger again for the visitation of heaven. Get in one accord with this King. And let's see heaven shatter every chain and part the people of God and lead us forward in the powerful name of Jesus. And everybody in the house said, Amen. Hallelujah.